Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. All my day. The Center for Constitutional Rights has filed a lawsuit on behalf of the human rights organization Defense for Children, Palestine, Al Haq, a Palestinian human rights group based in the occupied West Bank, and eight Palestinians and U.S. citizens with relatives in Gaza. The lawsuit accuses President Joe Biden and other senior officials of being complicit in Israel's genocide in Gaza. The case is being heard in a federal court in California. Lawyers representing Biden, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin have attended the proceedings along with the plaintiffs who accuse them of, quote, failure to prevent and complicity in the Israeli government's unfolding genocide. Since the October 7th incursion by Hamas and other resistance groups, which left some 1,200 people dead in Israel, more than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed. Thousands are missing. Over 60,000 have been injured. And nearly all of the Gaza Strip's 2.3 million people have been displaced, many sleeping out in the open near the border town of Rafah. Israel's blockage of humanitarian supplies and food have caused a widespread famine, many are dying of starvation and infectious diseases. The CCR complaint was filed in November of last year. It charges that Biden, Blinken, and Austin, quote, have not only been failing to uphold the country's obligation to prevent a genocide, but have enabled the conditions for its development by providing unconditional military and diplomatic support to Israel. The CCR is asking the court to, quote, declare that defendants have violated their duty under customary international law as part of the federal common law to take all measures within their power to prevent Israel from committing genocide against the Palestinian people of Gaza. The CCR is also calling for the U.S. to use its influence over Israel to end the hostilities against Palestinians in Gaza. Joining me to discuss the case is Catherine Gallagher, a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights, and one of the plaintiffs, Ayman Najim, who's from the Gaza Strip and is currently a doctoral student of transformative social change at Saybrook University in Pasadena, California. So let's begin, before we go into the law itself, let's just begin uh, maybe I'll start with you, Catherine. Uh, just w- the the facts on the ground, what we are seeing in Gaza, and then we can go into how it uh, how the law addresses those facts. Well, thank you for for having both of us today to talk about the the case and the very very dire and urgent situation in Gaza. What we've seen since October seventh is a complete and total assault on the entire Palestinian population in Gaza. And what we are seeing at this moment is the risk of mass death, not simply from the bombs falling, but through starvation. And this moment now at the start of Ramadan of mass starvation, of children dying, small children and babies dying from hunger is in fact the culmination of what was set out as policy and frankly a genocidal intention expressed clearly by senior Israeli officials as early as October 9th, when the the Israeli Minister of Defense promised that the entire Gaza Strip would be subjected to a total siege with no food, no fuel, no electricity, no water. And what we've seen over the course of many months of bombing now is a decimation of the, the entire healthcare infrastructure and mass displacement. So this death that is really at, everyone is at risk of, again, not from only the bombs, many, 
the vast majority of which are coming from the United States, but also from hunger. And that is not a, a man-made or human-made, um, that is not a, a, a humanitarian disaster. It is a human-made policy by Israeli officials that is bringing us to this moment of, of mass starvation and impending death for so, so many. So, Ayman, let you have, obviously, friends and family in Gaza. Um, one of the things that struck me is the way the Israelis have targeted uh, all of the cultural institutions, all the intellectual class, all the universities obliterated, been dynamited and destroyed or, or bombed, uh, the, the uh, targeting of the press. But talk a little bit about the what you're hearing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, in terms of what Palestinians are undergoing. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you for having both of us. Uh, it is uh, an honor to be here and to be interviewed by you personally. Uh, I think, uh, let's start, I think what's going on in, in, in Gaza specifically is a slow motion genocide since 17 years ago. It wasn't like yesterday or since October 7th. Uh, I have lived all of my life in Gaza. I remember actually in 2014, I have to actually roam all over Gaza to find diapers to my uh, my daughter, four hours, a lack of electricity, lack of drinking water. We have been struggling for that for 17 years. That's why I, I really like, as someone who studies psychology, I like to go to go to, to the slow motion genocide and, uh, and the history of settler colonialism and 75 years of ethnic cleansing, displacement and apartheid. What's going right now is accelerated genocide, is a fast motion genocide that is the most live stream, the most well corroborated, the most well substantiated uh, genocide in human history. Give you some examples. Uh, for the last uh, for the last 100 days, I couldn't hear my mother's voice, even her prayer during Ramadan, which is very important to me to for someone who lives uh, overseas. Uh, to hear my mother's prayer is extremely uh, uh, important. Uh, to, she lacks medication for, for, for days. I actually don't know if she is alive or not. Like imagine like for a hundred days that I, I have no clue what's going on in, in, in my refugee camp. Uh, but recently I got in touch with my sister-in-law, uh, uh, Rafah, uh, and she has a SIM card or something like that. And actually she was looking for a tent, a tent, a tent right now is cost 225,000 uh, uh, shekels, which I think $500. Imagine a tent that is cost like, I think $25 or $30 here in the US. It costs in Gaza $500 for the one of the most impoverished people on earth, one of the most besieged and also caged uh, uh, enclave on human history. Uh, so what's going on right now, uh, it, it is very genocidal that we are not dealing with uh, 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 with ongoing trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder. We are dealing with genocidal trauma that it will take us at least 20 years uh, to to find ways, creative pra practices or creative ways to heal uh, the trauma that have been inflicted in us. Actually, there in our uh in Gaza and here, because this is live streamed uh, 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 everywhere. Uh, uh, I want to share also that uh, what we are requesting or what we are asking is to end that genocide uh, 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 on Gaza. Uh, uh, it has been for, for so long. It has been, uh, it, it disrupted everything, cultural, heritage, social, uh, dimensions, social dynamics inside Gaza, and also uh, uh, cultural. Like for for instance, we have a, a cultural genocide. Actually, like when you are talking about the tree, one of the <laughs> oldest churches in human history have been obliterated uh, in Gaza. When you are talking about Omari, <coughs> Al Omari Mosque, Al Omari Mosque, that is actually the heritage. Like I think it is the second after Al Aqsa Mosque. In, in at least in our uh, uh, in our perception, uh, I've been in Gaza eight months ago to visit my family after twelve years of being in the United States, and I can tell you, I can attest, what's going on is just slow to medium to fast motion genocide that we are 
we are experiencing and we have been yelling and screaming actually for a while. It's not like since uh, five months ago, we have been yelling and screaming that we are caged, our people are caged, uh, and they want to just Egypt. Egypt, the border, everything is very uh, strict and a staggering siege on, on 2.3 uh, million people. I'm going to stop here. I think we can dive deeper into cultural, uh, medical, uh, social, political, everything uh, about genocide. So it is much more than the legality of it. It's just there are so many. Uh, it is multi-layered way of uh, that genocide. Right. You're referring, Ayman, to the siege that was set up after the elections in 2006 when Hamas took control of Gaza, uh, turning Gaza into an open-air prison. We're watching the Egyptian government, it looks like, build an alternative open-air prison across the border uh, in the Sinai. Uh, I want Catherine to talk about the law. Uh, and it's my understanding, as Iman raised this point, that the obliteration of uh, historical monuments, cultural centers, the essential erasure of the uh, an attempt at the erasure of the identity of a people is is very much part of genocide yes yes and I, I'll talk about the law going through a, a couple of different crimes that are playing out right now and as Iman has has said have been playing out for a number of years in Gaza but to see what what is happening since October 7th, genocide is the correct legal characterization. Um, the, the crime of genocide, which was codified in the Genocide Convention of 1948, following the horrors of the Holocaust, with the United States playing a key role in drafting and um, establishing that convention and the prohibition against genocide, Genocide is the destruction in whole or in part of a group that is targeted because of their nationality, their ethnicity, their race, or their religion. And that intent to destroy, we'll come back to that. Um, genocide is carried out by a number of underlying acts, three of which are, are definitely present here. The first is killing, so killing members of that targeted group. The second is causing serious mental or physical harm. And the third is creating, deliberately inflicting, creating the conditions of life to destroy the physical group again in whole or in part. And so it's the infliction of these conditions. It's not even the result, but the, the very infliction of conditions to destroy the group. So going back to that statement that I, I referenced earlier, of Israeli Defense Minister Gallant on October 9th, when he and then the Minister of Electricity followed up the next day, promised no food, no fuel, no electricity, and no water, creating that total siege, which is a an upgrade from the already years-long blockade and siege on, on Gaza. That was, in fact, a expression of an underlying act of, of genocide, the creating the conditions of life, taking away the basic necessities of food, of water, of electricity um, for human survival. And it was done not against Hamas, but it was done targeting the entire population of Gaza, the entire Palestinian population of Gaza. So that gives you the intent to destroy one of the protected groups, whether it's based on nationality or, or ethnicity, however um, you're, you're looking at the Palestinian people as a people. It is not um, cultural genocide, it's not recognized as a crime. Um, it's not a, a separate category to destroy the culture, but one of the things that the the jurisprudence on genocide has showed that when you target um, pieces of a cultural identity, like um, cultural centers or religious institutions or libraries, this is a, a way to erase and destroy that group as well. So it's not that cultural genocide per se is a 
illegal um, a, a part of genocide, but it is an indicia of targeting a, a people. And in here, it's the Palestinian people of Gaza. So already by October 18th, CCR put out a briefing paper, a legal and factual analysis of the statements made by Israeli officials and the actions that they took in furtherance of those statements. So these are statements including that imposition of the total siege, the calling of the entire Palestinian population in Gaza, human animals, that dehumanizing language, and statements by the president and the prime minister of Israel promising again to wipe out or to have Gaza look nothing like it was before, for everyone to have to leave. These statements were all said. And so our briefing paper at that point was a warning because the Genocide Convention, in addition to prohibiting um, the commission of genocide or a complicity, meaning aiding and abetting genocide, it also imposes a duty on all states who are members of the Genocide Convention to prevent, to take active measures to prevent genocide from, quote, the moment that there is a serious risk of genocide. So again, those statements were indicators of a risk of genocide, and we had warnings coming out from the United Nations already back in October. And rather than uphold its duty to do everything it could to stop a genocide against the Palestinian population in Gaza, the United States affirmatively expressed support for Israel's operation. It sent weapons and has continued, as we've learned, to send over a hundred different um, weapons deliveries while opening the gates to the $4.4 billion of stockpiled weapons in Israel for Israel's use in Gaza. And it has blocked measures um, at the United Nations Security Council for a ceasefire. So the United States has failed in its duty to prevent and it has actively been complicit in genocide. Now, genocide is, is one crime, and we have ha had the International Court of Justice, of course, rule um, six weeks ago that there was a plausible genocide in Gaza. But there are also crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity are the widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population. So here, again, when you have measures like the total siege imposed in targeting all of the Palestinians in Gaza, the, the at least half of whom are children, and the vast majority of the victims are women and children in this, in this horror that we've all been bearing witness to for the last 160 plus days now. Um, this is the civilian population that is being targeted. So it is a crime against humanity. And then you look at the specific crimes that could include murder, that could include extermination, which is on the spectrum with genocide. And it could include things that we're seeing, deportation and forcible transfer. In those first days of the assault on Gaza, there was the quote unquote evacuation order where over a million people were ordered to move from the north to the south, supposedly for safety. I mean, not only were some of them bombed on the way, but we've seen what's happened over the last months as that space has continually shrunk and the Palestinian population who supposedly were displaced and, and transferred for safety have been bombed and attacked everywhere that they've gone, rendered homeless, um, without food, as, as I'm in described, seeking any kind of shelter that they can, um, so we have crimes against humanity. And of course we have war crimes. Uh, the reason why I, I, I end with war crimes rather than start is because we've had war crimes and we've certainly also had crimes against humanity going on for a number of years. Gaza is part of the occupied Palestinian territory. And that status as occupied territory brings in international humanitarian law. So. IHL, as it's known, has applied across the occupied Palestinian territory since 1967 and continues to apply at this very day. 
So that means the Geneva Conventions apply and should be protecting the Palestinian population in Gaza. But what we've seen over the last years, and especially since September 11th, um, taking a, a page from the United States playbook, is we've seen that international humanitarian law has been converted into a, a sword rather than a shield for, for the protection of civilians. And it's often been used to justify attacks. So these debates around human shields and military necessity, um, these, these political um, arguments around war crimes and, and international humanitarian law have really unfortunately had the effect of not having the core purpose, again, protection of civilians be realized, but rather it's been um, an excuse or a use for more force against the occupied territory. So a very long answer to your question, um, but that there is at bottom line, there is applicable international law. The vast majority of this law has been implemented into national systems around the world. We have a war crime statute in the United States. We have a genocide statute in the United States. And of course there's an international criminal court in The Hague that has active jurisdiction over all of these crimes at this very moment. Well, one of the caveats that Israel is well aware of uh, is that if, for instance, a hospital or a medical facility, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Catherine, is being used by uh, armed opponents, uh, then it, 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 that uh, protection that it has under international law is wiped out, uh, which is why Israel claims that every hospital is a Hamas command center. Uh, of course, they've never managed to produce any evidence that that is the case. But, you know, linguistically, they, they found ways to essentially cancel out the rules of war. Is that correct? Well, they have tried to. And I don't, I think that doesn't mean it's correct. Um, you have protections for civilian objects and civilians. And that is a cardinal principle in international humanitarian law that you have to distinguish between civilians and civilian objects on the one side and, and military targets on the other. So the first step is to determine whether there are civilians present or whether this is in fact a, a, a military object. And that is something that requires scrutiny. And I'm not sure we're seeing that scrutiny. And then you have to do an assessment as to whether or not there is such a military necessity that you can actually do a strike knowing that there are protected civilians or that this is a protected civilian object. It's not that that's that civilian object loses its protection. It should still have that protection. We are not seeing that kind of proportionality analysis being done on a target by target basis, certainly, or else we would not have had um, two ton bombs being dropped on densely populated um, refugee camps resulting in the deaths of of scores and scores of people, the vast majority of whom are children and babies because their bodies absorb the shock from these huge massive bombs. Um, so we are not seeing even under the most generous for the military's purposes, uh, reading of, of IHL, we are not seeing that kind of, of analysis. And again, I would suggest that the way this entire entire operation is being carried out, it is being carried out with the target of the operation being civilians. When you're dropping a two-ton bomb, a 2,000-pound bomb on a densely populated area, you are going to kill civilians. So it is hard to argue that they are not the object of that bomb. Um, you know, I, I, I had worked at the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal for a number of, of years. And when we look at the shelling of Sarajevo, 
we don't hear people talking all the time about, oh, human shields. There were civilians present. Wow, those those pesky Bosnian Muslims for having civilians in, in the in the area. No, we look at the way the Republic of Srpska military targeted an area that was densely populated with civilians. The rules of armed conflict, the laws of war have been really turned on their head, especially again, since the 9-11 uh, years by the United States working very closely, frankly, with Israel and putting forward a counter narrative that has really weaponized um, the Geneva Conventions in a way to justify military assaults that have often um, really as their target, which we can only infer, civilians. I'm an, I want to talk about law. Uh, there are two sets of laws, one for Palestinians in the apartheid state of Israel and one for Israeli Jews, maybe three sets, and another for Palestinian Arabs who are uh, citizens of Israel, which is about 20% of Israel. So first talk about the, the law in the occupied territories in Palestine as an instrument of oppression. And then uh, we have seen uh, from the inception of the state of Israel how Israel has, uh, in a very cavalier fashion, ignored international law repeatedly. Um, and uh, th that, ha that has been a constant uh, in this uh, settler colonial project. <clears throat> Thank you. I just want to start by the ID law. Uh, uh, if you are from Gaza, you cannot go to the West Bank and vice versa. I believe that was in 1951, 1953. So as uh, I am 40 years old, I have never been in the West Bank. I have never been in Ramallah. I have never been in Astud, where my grandfather lived for a generation, I couldn't even travel there. And I am 40 years old, and I am a US citizen, too. Uh, so, so this can give you the laws, like just an example. Uh, an example, other, uh, I was, when I was a child, I want to go to Jerusalem with my mother. I was denied to go to Jerusalem. I was 10 years old. I mean, uh, that was during, uh, you know, the presence or the physical presence of the occupation. Now, right now, the occupation is from the air and land and sea after 2005, you know, later in this engagement. So, I mean, the laws, I, I personally call it, it is a caste system. It's much more, uh, when you when you look at the second class citizenship in inside uh, 48 Palestine, or when you look at the ethnic cleansing, and right now the forced displacement in Masaf Yatta, South Hebron. And when you look into, into the daily incursion the daily night incursion in, 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 in the West Bank. So I think these are laws. I mean, we have the uh, 2008 uh, Jewish uh, uh, basic law, which actually gives self-determination for the Jewish people, uh, uh, while, while people who are really under, languishing under apartheid and settler colonialism for for actually 100 years since uh, 1917 with the uh, Balfour Declaration, they have they were uh, they were seeking for self determination. That we are actually we are the ones who are uh, we are abiding by the international law and seeking for our self determination for for years. Uh, I don't think that Palestine has been free in all of, uh, from Ottoman Empire to British uh, mandate than to. Uh, uh, you know, 1948. So these are laws, and uh, I think laws uh, are made actually to subjugate uh, and uh, to keep uh, to keep the occupation. I think in Adala, uh, Adala organization uh, in 48, they have documented actually on their website the number of racist laws, the number of racist laws. Uh, I mean, honestly, we cannot even count the racist laws. I mean, uh, for us in Gaza, we felt uh, for for years, actually, someone who grew and uh, raised in Gaza for 22 years in Gaza. Uh, uh, I, I remember, uh, uh, like, I, like someone from Brooklyn can come and swim in our Mediterranean Sea, and I cannot swim. Uh, I'm not sure because of how I look like or, uh, or 
uh, I don't know, like the Kfar Darom settlement uh, actually was literally five minutes from my family house. And we couldn't, like all of our childhood, childhood we couldn't go to the Khan Yunis. Uh, I live in Deir al-Balakh, which is adjacent to Khan Yunis. Khan Yunis is to the south. Like all of my entire like childhood, like uh, stuck in a very tiny refugee camp called Deir al-Balakh, which stands for Deir al-Balakh. Uh, for chapel of Ma- Pam Monastery, because and very important to Chris here, because some people think that Palestine is just Palestine is a mosaic of culture, religion, religious, and like social uh, uh, beliefs. Like we are Christian, we are Muslims, we are just like even the name of my my camp is Dar al Balah, the chapel of Pam Monastery. So we have long, long, long history that Israel is trying to obliterate our culture, identity, and our self, uh, or identity, uh, and also our reclamation to our indigenous land. Uh, very important, like, I'm not sure, like, when you bombard uh, or when you annihilate, I like to use annihilate churches or mosque and, or, uh, uh, and hospital and cultural center and basha, uh, Senate, uh, and also Palestinian Legislative uh, Council, which we actually f- felt in 1993 that we will have a, a country of our own, we will have a peace, or we will have, etc. And that was obliterated. Like, if you look at the carpet bombing, saturate, saturation bombing, actually, in all of Gaza Strip, like every area, I was speaking with my sister, like, uh, uh, like a hundred days ago, I, and that we are talking about hundreds, hundred days ago, and she was telling me literally, like carpet bombing everywhere, even the cemetery, uh, the close nearby her house, uh, in the first days of the war of the genocide, it has been like very smelly because people have no 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 places to to uh, to to to. Uh, to put their loved ones in burial uh, sites, uh, and uh, and that was going for a long time. I mean, everyone have seen uh, in the media, uh, and uh, life is stream. Life is stream. They have seen what the indigenous people in Gaza are languishing with. So uh, uh, that's why I think uh, we, as a plaintiff, we were honored to be reached by Center for Constitutional Rights. And I and I believe, Chris, I believe. Like if you ask right now how many people can be a plaintiff in this case, you will find at least a thousand people in the United States. You will find 2.3 million, they will be a plaintiff for this case. Because this is not uh, uh, an American, they will be uh, in this case. Because this is uh, not a crime, this is a crime of the crimes. And it is a moral imperative for every uh, freedom-loving people to support Palestine. Because Palestine is not just also a global South issue. Palestine is the more, is the humanitarian, a humanist issue that everyone should fight for. You should not be Jewish, Christian, or Muslim to fight for Palestine. You should be human to support the indigenous people's right to live, especially this time. Catherine, were you, the, were you surprised, some of us were, that they accepted the case? And then I want you to talk about the response of the defense. Sure. So we filed our case on November 13th in um, in California in a federal court. And the United States has fought this case uh, quite, quite um, strongly. Um, so... Yes, the, they accepted the filing of the case, but the Department of Justice has come in um, and responded quite quickly saying that the federal courts in the United States can't touch, can't reach the President of the United States, Secretary of State Blinken, or Secretary of State Austin. And even if there is a binding legal obligation to take all measures within the United States considerable power vis-a-vis Israel or its obligations not to be complicit in genocide, it's not for a U.S. court to do anything. Now, as the United States says to a U.S. court, you can't adjudicate this case. You can't hear this case. It's also, of course, um, pushing back on South Africa's effort at the International Court of Justice and as we've seen, 
the United States has pushed back aggressively, particularly during the Trump administration, but it really hasn't let up at, at much um, against the International Criminal Court. We still have Secretary of State Blinken speaking out against the ICC investigating Israeli officials for crimes committed on the occupied Palestinian territory. So in our case, the U.S. is not here, and really it has said not anywhere. So we had a briefing first in, in over the course of December. Um, we have sought not only a declaratory judgment, but we had also sought an injunction. We had asked the court to put in place a preliminary injunction while the case proceeded to stop further support by the United States for the ongoing genocide. So this is not a challenge across the board to all military aid or political support, but rather that military assistance that is going to be used to further the genocide in Gaza, the attack against the Palestinian population in Gaza. And as public reporting has, has made clear, the vast majority of weapons being used against the Palestinian population in Gaza are coming from the United States and have continued to come from the United States after October 7th through at least December, if not continuing now as, as recent reporting from the Washington Post showed. So we were asking the court to say no in order to comply with your legal obligations, not to further a genocide. You can't send the means by which a genocide is, is effectuated, meaning the, the military um, hardware that's being used to kill at this point now, over 31,000 Palestinians, as you mentioned in the introduction, injure um, tens of thousands more and has brought the entire population to the brink of, of death, especially children, um, through the campaign of, of the total siege to deny food. So we had a hearing um, on the preliminary injunction and the government's request to dismiss the case in Oakland on J January 26th. And it was a hearing unlike anything uh, that I've been a part of at my 17 years at CCR. We had first legal argument, um, trying to explain to the court why it is that this case was not one that fell within the quote, political question doctrine, which is the, the legal argument that the Department of Justice put forward, essentially arguing that this case is a challenge to US government policy and it's inappropriate for courts to dictate what US policy is. Our response was no, this is not a challenge to policy. This is a, a request for the court to do what it does every day, identify the law and order defendants to comply with the law. Here the law happens to be genocide um, and the prohibition against furthering a genocide. It is a identifiable crime with elements, just like every other crime. And the court can in fact put forward an, an order um, to stop genocide. So we had the legal argument and then we had about three and a half hours of testimony from a number of our plaintiffs, including one, uh, a young doctor, calling in to the courthouse in California um, from the hospital in Rafa. And he testified as to the reality on the ground there. We had Defense for Children International Palestine, which has been doing the very, very difficult work of documenting um, the injury and death to Palestinian children in Gaza. They testified from Ramallah remotely. And then a number of our Palestinian American plaintiffs told in, in really heartbreaking detail um, what it's been like to be far from their families, as, as Ayman has spoken about already today, um, wondering each day whether their family would be alive. The, the number of family members who have been killed exceeds 100. Um, one of our organizational plaintiffs, staff member Ahmed Abu Ful lost over 60 members of his, his family. So the judge listened quite intently to the testimony of the plaintiffs, as well as a historian, uh, Holocaust and, and Jewish studies historian, uh, Barry Trachtenberg, testify. 
And the judge at the end of the hearing said that in his many, many years on the bench, um, he was a George W. Bush appointee, so he's been on the, the bench a while, that this was the most difficult factual and legal case that he's heard. Unfortunately, that didn't stop him um, from dismissing the case on this political question grounds. And he did not engage um, sufficiently with our arguments unfortunately, that this is a case about a legal duty and not about policy. But he did hear our plaintiffs and he did understand the gravity of the crimes. And he found that there is a plausible genocide taking place at this moment in Gaza. And he found that the United States, quote, unflagging support for this genocide is happening. And he, quote, implored the executive um, defendants, the president, secretaries of state and defense, to stop that support. We have not seen a stop to that support, and we have appealed the case. So our appeal brief went in on March 8th um, last week, and we have had the first amicus brief come in in support of us today by Jewish Voice for Peace, and we anticipate a number of um, amicus briefs coming in on March 14th, also in support of the case. So we have an expedited appeal schedule because we have people who are whose lives are at risk every day in Gaza. Again, especially the next generation, the children and the babies who do not have access to food and water and, and formula and 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 milk because of um, the famine in place in Gaza. So we, we are pushing for this case to be heard as quickly as possible. And we hope that the Court of Appeals will recognize that a federal court absolutely has the power and indeed has the responsibility to hear claims of genocide when we're talking about senior US officials in breach of binding domestic law that prohibits genocide and complicity in genocide and binding international law through the Genocide Convention. So that's that's where the case stands at, at this moment. Um, but we really hope that even though this the, the case is um, so important, we hope that the Biden administration doesn't wait for a ruling from the Ninth Circuit and instead finally takes um, the action that the law requires and, and frankly that human decency and morality requires and stops its support for this genocide. If you're found guilty of complicity in genocide, are you legally defined as a war criminal? You, you, you could certainly use the word war criminal, but you could also use the word genocidaire, which is what we, the, the term that came out of the Rwandan genocide. So you are, um, war crimes are, are really often subsumed in the crime of, of genocide. Um, but I think the label could be even, even stronger. When you are furthering the destruction of an entire people because of who they are, um, in, a, in a crime that has been so condemned, including, and this is what's so, so frustrating, um, and including by the Biden administration. When Joe Biden came in to power, he promised to uphold human rights. He claimed that there would be a return to the rule of law. Um, the, the Biden administration has been happy to call out China for its support for genocide against the Uyghurs. And now, with the other hand, the United States is sending weapons even after the International Court of Justice identified a plausible genocide, even after a federal district court judge and I, who was appointed by George W. Bush, for whatever that matters, it, it shouldn't, um, calls out a plausible genocide, they continue to send weapons. So yes, the, the labels, unfortunately, now are, are complicity in the most serious of, of crimes. And I would just also note that Joe Biden, when he was a senator back in, in 1988, was on the Judiciary Committee. And it was under his watch and under his leadership 
that the United States finally ratified the Genocide Convention. So this is someone who has a track record purportedly of standing up for international law and for human rights. And what we're seeing now is the complete opposite. He also has a long track record of, of defending the apartheid state of Israel. Um, I mean, I want to close with you and I want to talk about betrayal. Uh, the betrayal by the international community for the Palestinians, betrayal by the Arab world. Uh, the Egyptian government is clearly uh, complicit now in this blockage of humanitarian aid. Uh, as I mentioned before, it is building what looks like an alternative open air prison, but this is just dogged Palestinians. Uh, and you're right, it's 100 years, and we should also note uh, that uh, when the state of Israel was founded in 1948, it adopted the British uh, settler colonial laws against Palestinians, incorporated that into their own legal system. But let's talk about that sense of betrayal. Uh, and, and of course, now we're watching the genocide in Gaza and rhetorically, uh, people are saying even the White House will essentially say things that uh, a, a attempt or appear to value Palestinian life while either at best doing nothing or in the case of the United States, aiding <clears throat> and abetting the genocide itself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think there is a sense of deep betrayal from uh, uh, Arab countries, especially Egypt and other countries, uh, and uh, there's a sense also, but we need to differentiate between uh, dictatorships, uh, dic draconian governments like in Egypt and uh, and other uh, uh, other uh, areas, uh, and also the people, uh, the people. Like I have been, uh, I when I was in Washington D.C. four days ago, I met an Egyptian uh, girl, and she was uh, she has a flyer, and she told me, uh, I came here uh, to Washington D.C. To, uh, to demonstrate and to have the sign, but I cannot do it in Egypt, which aches my heart because, as you know, in 2011, uh, we as Middle Eastern, uh, we hope there will be a change to the, the dictatorship of Hosni Mubarak to have a new uh, uh, civil uh, democracy, uh, and everything was counter counter revolution afterwards. So I think the people are really right now in uh, feeling hopeless and helpless, but also in deep anger inside the, the Middle East. The people, uh, like you can see, like in Tunisia, Algeria, where the one point uh, one uh, and a half million people died for their own self determination and liberation from, from the French. All Tunisia, all of these countries are really. Uh, 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 struggling to go to the streets, and also there is for us as from Gaza, we feel like where the where are the Arab wars? Where the international community? Where is the United States? Like the superpower? Where is where is Russia? Where is China? Like people from the streets writing on Facebook, where are they? They left us alone with the with Israel, the most well sophisticated. Uh, 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 Army. I mean, in terms of weapons and tanks, we as in Gaza, we we literally. Some people think like we have tanks, we have jet fighters, we have uh, gunboats. We have nothing. I mean, just for people to understand. So, I think uh, this this genocide has changed everything for Palestinians, because we believed actually that the 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 freedom in Palestine will entail three parts. 20, uh, 40 percent from us as Palestinian, like from inside, and 20, 20 to 30 percent is the international uh, pressure on Israel. And I believed in that time, like 10 percent will be from the Israeli left, like will ca come encouragement. And we have seen that with the Salem report about apartheid, and you know, human rights organization three years ago they started to say, oh, there is apartheid since uh, Israel inception. But we have been as indigenous people, we have lived it and we have told them like, it is a genocide, it is apartheid. We read also, we are not lawyers, but we lived it, we feel it. So so there is a sense of betrayal, but right now, uh, I think what we are focusing on is to end the genocide. Uh, end the genocide, end the genocide, because if we can save one life, 
And that's why we joined uh, the, uh, the lawsuit. If we can save my mother's life, or my father's life, or my cousins, my nieces, everyone is living in Gaza. Uh, I think uh, right now in the genocide, by whatever means possible, like we, we go after President Biden of aiding and abetting genocide and being complicit in genocide, Austin and Blinken, and even or any officials who put their hands actually to be to be killing and murdering without compunction or remorse or contrite, like 12,000 children. I remember in, 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 in Srebrenica or like uh, uh, Sarajevo, it was 8,300 people who were uh, uh, murdered in uh, that genocide. In Rwanda, 1994, 100,000 or 800,000 in, in 100 days. But we are in five months, we are talking about 30, more than 30,000. And actually, and imagine the people who are under the rubble, like how many people will come out of, of this. So yes, there's a sense of betrayal. There's a sense of that we are left alone. There is nothing going on. Uh, 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 and it's very precarious situation at the same time. Like uh, when you are like in the North or in the South, you have two options, whether to live or whether to leave or to die. And that's what happens to us in 94 eight whether to live or to die. And not any death also. As you know, Hind Rajab, she was in the in the, uh, in the the car when they uh, uh, attacked her. Everything is documented. Al-Ma'madani, uh, Al-Ma'madani uh, Hospital in, in Gaza, 500. So everything is, uh, is documented uh, for us. So right now we are asking to end the genocide so I can save my mother, my wife's, uh, family in, in Rafah, everyone's to save them, then we will find way to articulate our healing practices uh, because it's going to take us a while. I worked with kids for like for 15 years uh, in a trauma, trauma healing and uh, and uh, and, identif and and to fight against internalized oppression, as you know, in war zones like internalized oppression is. And this one will be, uh, will entail like a collective internationalist healing perspective or praxis to to help heal the, that that kind of trauma while there's a betrayal from everyone while there's a sense of hopelessness and helplessness uh, and and guilt I mean honestly Chris I'm gonna share with you like yesterday I uh, I broke my fast uh, with my family and then I have food guilt I, that I can eat and I can provide food for my my kids and my wife. And I, I'm not sure if my mother can is eating or not, or not even my mother. Like people in the north, air drops for us, air drops for people. United States sending billions of dollars to Israel. They cannot enforce food through Rafah crossing at least or Karim Shalom crossing. You send billions of dollars. Like it's just mind-boggling to me. I'm not a policy guy, but it's just for me. It's just mind-boggling. To, to, to see the power dynamics and to see it like in a broad daylight, air drops uh, that goes uh, uh, for the people in the north. And I, I really did not check if what kind of food are they are dropping, a hamburger or or some kind of, uh, I really did not know. Like I have to look it up to, to see what they are dropping. Great, thank yeah. you. That was Ayman Najim, who is from Gaza and Center for Constitutional Rights Senior Staff Attorney, Catherine Gallagher. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrishedges.substack.com. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.